Hello, my name is Allison Werner and I am the Chief Editor of Orthodontic Products. Thank you for joining us today. Today we're going to talk to Dr. Jeffrey Miller about the role of CBCT in the orthodontic practice. One of the arguments against direct-to-consumer aligner companies is centered on how they are putting patients at risk for complications of poor or poor treatment because they are performing aligner treatment without proper imaging. But the reality is orthodontists may also be putting their patients at risk for long-term complications for, the sim for similar reasons. The fact is today's imaging technology can give orthodontists a more complete picture of the patient's alveolar bone anatomy. And with this information, they may improve the long-term consequences of orthodontic treatment. As I said, we are talking to Dr. Jeffrey Miller today, an orthodontist in private practice in Baltimore, Maryland, who frequently lectures on comb beam computed tomography, or CBCT, technology in orthodontics. We wanted to talk to him about what CBCT imaging brings to the orthodontic brings to orthodontic treatment planning and treatment outcomes. Dr. Miller, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Well, let's get started. How does CBCT imaging improve orthodontic treatment as well as change the way orthodontic treatment results are evaluated? So for, there's many uses for comb beam CT, but mm -hmm. for orthodontists specifically, it has to do with a shift from using cephalometric analysis where we're taking a two-dimensional x-ray and trying to measure relationships between the teeth and the bone that support it to with comb beam CT, orthodontists for the first time are actually able to visualize the position of the root within the alveolar housing for individual tooth. And that, what that also means is that when the cases are completed orthodontically, we can look back and see if we were able as orthodontists to keep that tooth within the alveolar housing, or if the tooth is pushed out or expanded outside of the alveolar housing and it dehisses through the cortical plate, you know, what does that mean and what does that look like and does it really matter? You know, I think the argument that uh, if you use, you know, certain magical appliances orthodontically that you can expand and there are no consequences because the bone modifies as the tooth or the root is expanded, I think that's pretty much been put to bed that that does not happen. There's many studies, they all point in exactly the same direction. I am aware that there are still orthodontists making those claims. Uh, I would just say, in my humble opinion, that they should be looking at the literature and not at the information that's provided by the manufacturer of those orthodontic systems. Okay. Well, um, a greater percentage of orthodontic practices are using 2D supplementary imaging than CBCT. And there are those orthodontists who think this cephalometric analysis gives them all that they need for treatment planning and tracking outcomes, but what are they missing? So when you look at a two-dimensional ceph, and they're usually using a combination of a cephalometric uh, x-ray as well, and a panorex to kind of look at, uh, you know, the they're looking at those two images to kind of treatment plan or help them treatment plan an orthodontic case. But what they're missing is they're missing that they can't visualize properly what the what the alveolar anatomy is for individual tooth. So the alveolar anatomy or the alveolar housing that supports that tooth not only varies between different individuals, it actually varies in different segments of the same individual's arch. And there's no way to uh, look at that and evaluate it with a CEPH and PAN. They're, it's just too limited. So why so few orthodontists uh, use a comb beam currently? I think it's it's actually kind of sad because here we have a tool that allows us, I, I believe, a, a much more uh, detailed you know, way of treating these patients and, and evaluating their finished results. But, you know, there's a tendency to want to hold on to what you're comfortable with. And also, when when you look at comb beam, it's also a matter of knowing how to use it. A lot of orthodontists that's, that actually have comb beam, they're using it for other things. They're maybe looking at the, the temper mandibular joint, and that's why they have the comb beam machine, or they're looking at airway, which I'm not sure is really a, a valid use for comb beam. 
but they what they tend to do is take the cone beam and reconstruct the pan and ceph from the cone beam. And they're still, even though they're taking cone beam, they're still using the same cephalometric analysis where the real difference is that when you start looking at individual teeth and the alveolar housing, it really does change everything for you orthodontically, not only in the way you treatment plan the cases, but the way you evaluate your finished results. For example, if you have a case where you're not sure, you know, say you're, you're, you think it's a borderline extraction case and you are just trying to decide, you know, is the best thing for this patient to extract four teeth, to expand, to, to do interproximal reduction, you can finish that case in any, any of those three treatment strategies. And clinically, the case is going to look good. It, the, the clinical crowns of those teeth are going to be aligned. And you may think you did a really good job. But when you look at it from a perspective of a cone beam CT versus a pan and ceph post-treatment, you may realize that, oh, I expanded this case, but these cuspid roots are halfway out of the alveolar housing. And, you know, that information will, will help you for the next case you treat. So the next case you see, you'll say, well, wait a second, let me rethink this. Maybe there's a better way to do it. Maybe I should do a little more IPR. And, it, you know, this is not an argument about extraction versus non-extraction. It's an argument is to what is the best way to keep the teeth within the alveolar housing uh, when you do orthodontic treatment. And, and you know, it's a, it's a goal. I, th I believe it's a gold standard because I don't think anybody's going to uh, disagree that a healthier tooth is one that is the root is completely surrounded by bone. And once you minimize or compromise that bone support, that tooth is not as healthy as it was when it was surrounded by bone. Now we can at least visualize it. And mm -hmm. by the way, orthodontists are some of the smartest people on the planet. Mm -hmm. And they come up with these rationalizations as to why cone beam's not necessary. And they come in different forms, but basically it's, you know, the cone beam uh, doesn't, sh there might be 0.6 millimeters bone missing that is not, that shows, it shows as missing on the cone beam but it actually might be there. And they'll, they'll also say, well, dehiscence and fenestrations are present in most of the population. And cone beam CT studies show that there's a lot of positive, false positives, when in other words, on a cone beam, it looks like the, a dehiscence and it actually, it, it, there is actually bone there. But those things are, if you really think about them and they're really, pretty meaningless for orthodontists because the, the dehiscence studies are all done on naturally occurring dehiscence that are very minor. So, you know, orthodontically, you, we make an effort to keep the teeth within the alveolar housing. If you violate that a little bit, I'm not sure it really affects the long-term health of the tooth. When you, when we're talking about is orthodontics that causes the root to go halfway out of the alveolar housing, that's a significant magnitude. And orthodontists kind of are putting these things in the same category where it's, you know, a big difference between an orthodontically induced dehiscence where the root is significant, significantly out of the alveolar housing and one that just slightly is. And, you know, these kind of, these are the arguments that are kind of being projected today. And, you know, I have even, you know, the 0.6 millimeters of non-visible bone on the cone beam CT is actually plus or minus 0.6 millimeters. They tend to forget that. But there is a process of or rationalization that I hear quite often that anytime you see a root dehiscence on a cone beam, it always has 0.6 millimeters of bone there. And that's not at all what those studies show. It's a it's a total uh abomination of that information. But it sounds, you know, I guess it's a rationalization when you see it post-treatment. And if you don't, if you don't, uh, if you think that's, you know, when you see the dehiscence and you don't do anything about it, it's not going to help you for the next 150 cases you treat. You know, you got to recognize it first. And we finally are able to have a tool where we can do this.
and it does change things orthodontically. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so you talked a little bit about some of the risks of not using cone beam CT imaging as part of treatment planning. Can you talk about anything else orthodontists should be recognizing by not using this technology? Well, well, the big one is they 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 won't be able to recognize. There's you know there's two things. One is you the pre the treatment diagnosis that goes on that determines the treatment strategy that's appropriate for that individual patient. And then also, you know, the finished result, you know, how do you evaluate a finished result? There's a lots of finished results orthodontically that clinically look fantastic because you're only evaluating those cases based on the clinical crowns. It's almost like with Invisalign, the virtual setups all look perfect the tissue always looks perfect, but the tissue is, has no basis in reality. The tissue is painted on and those on those virtual setups by a technician. So when you ex, you can expand and the tissue still looks fine, well, it's the same thing that happens clinically. The tissue response to the dehiscence and fenestration uh, is a lagger. It doesn't happen immediately, usually. You know, it's a function also of the gingival phenotype and or hygiene, things like, and health of the patient, but in general, it won't appear right away. I mean, there's plenty of of cases out there where you, you know, there's no question the root was, you know, mostly pushed out of the bone, and the the tissue is almost like a stretch rubber band around the the anatomy of of that root, but the tissue response, which is a, a loss of tissue, which is gingival recession or gingival dehiscence hasn't occurred yet. So, you know, it's a lo it's also a long-term perspective and these things still need to be uh, studied because, you know, we, I think it's, we pretty much in the literature, I believe the literature pretty much is clear that if you orthodontically move the tooth through the alveolar housing, you're gonna create root dehiscence or fenestration. But what's not exactly clear is how does that affect the tissue? So someone with a thicker gingival phenotype may be able to get away with like more root dehiscence than someone with a thinner gingival phenotype. And you know these are things that it, it's it seems you know you can draw conclusions, but I don't believe they've been really properly studied. Okay. Um, one of the things you know we talked earlier, and one of the things you mentioned was that by not using comb bean CT uh, to kind of monitor and to also check those finishes, down the road, orthodontists could be putting themselves at risk if another, provide, if another um, dental provider examines them and sees undesirable consequences of the orthodontic yeah, treatment. Yeah, that's a, a, that? yeah, so, you know, orthodontists, we don't, we don't practice in a vacuum. You know, our patients are usually shared patients with other dental providers. So when we treat a case, you know, a we and we take a post-treatment CEF or PAN to look at that, you know, our finish. You know, the general dentist is generally not going to take a PAN and CEF just to look at the result of the orthodontic treatment. But as cone beam CTs become less expensive, the, the delta or the difference in price between a digital pan and a, a cone beam CT is, is smaller. It's the gap is much, much smaller considering that the fee the general dentist gets for a cone beam versus a pan is significantly higher when that general dentist, and it could be any dentist, I'm just using a general dentist as an example, when that general dentist needs to replace his pan machine, you know, is he going to replace, he or she going to replace it with a cone beam CT or another digital pan, which is kind of becoming outdated. And I think if you talk to the general dentist, when they're looking for a new machine, they're looking in the direction of a cone beam CT because the cost is really not that much and they can generate higher fees. So that patient that was treated today by an orthodontist that where the roots were violated or dehissed through the cortical plates, that patient then 
five years from now goes to their general dentist and that general dentist takes a cone beam CT versus the pan they take every two or three years. When they look at that cone beam, the pattern of dehiscence, the generalized pattern of dehiscence that occurs from orthodontic treatment or poor orthodontic treatment is very obvious. So then what does the dentist do? Does the dentist ignore it completely? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, the general dentists are, are more than happy to criticize the orthodontist as, a, as it is today. I mean, for stuff we had no, no, we're not even guilty of. Here's something we are guilty of. <laughs> you know, these general dentists are going to look at these cone beams and go, oh my God, you're, the roots from your lower first bicuspid, the uh, lower first bicuspid, look like they're dehissed through the cortical plate. Let me send this over to a oral maxillofacial radiologist to read. The report's going to come back and the radiologist is going to say, you know, two thirds of the bone is missing on the buccal surface. Even in the absence of tissue dehiscence, is that, what's that dentist's obligation to that patient? Mm -hmm. They're going to make, my guess is they're going to make a referral to a, a periodontist. So if you, mm -hmm. if you think about it, you know, five years from now, they go, the cases you treat today, you, even in the absence of tissue dehiscence, are going to be evaluated with a cone beam at some point in the next 10 years, most likely. Right. If there is tissue dehiscence, the the general dentists are going to take a cone beam and say, well, your root's sticking out. That wasn't there before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the idea that they were brushing too hard and, uh, you know, and they did it to themselves, you know, we're honest, we, I mean, I believe we contribute to it. And I think there is documentation that, sh that, shows clearly that orthodontics is related to an increased incidence of gingival recession. Now, mm -hmm. the same argument happens with that as well in the orthodontic community. This, you know, there's studies that show as you get older, gingival tissue recedes. But when you talk about gingival recession related to orthodontic root, you know, dehiscence, you're talking about the of gingival recession of at a high, much higher level. It's a higher magnitude and it happens sooner on a younger population. So, you, you know, we tend to put all these things in one category and, you know, for, I, I believe it's just a rationalization, but it's, they don't fit in all one category. It's, it's just like saying, you know, I smoked a cigarette once when I was 14 and I am at the same health risk as someone that smokes four packs a day for 40 years. There is, you know, there's, there's a difference in the, magnitude of these these problems that are associated with these these types of you know treatment so one of the arguments and you talked a little bit about this but one of the arguments against um, cone beam ct use is the risk of false positives associated with dehiscence and fenestrations are the false positives really as common as some believe and how does this impact the use of cone beam ct for orthodontic patients so the the it is true the false positives of are quite common, and, but the false positives are mostly related to minimal uh, root dehiscence. So it, it kind of goes together with the point, the possible plus or minus 0. 0.6 millimeters of bone that may not be visible. So when you have a tooth, like a, you know, prominent cuspid, you know, you're going to see along that facial surface on a comb, you, you might see a very thin thread of bone on the axial view. You know, is it is their bone there, or is it just slightly dehissed? Well, it could be slightly dehissed, but I don't think that really matters in terms of orthodontics, other than if you have a slightly dehissed root or very very thin bone uh, on, let's say, on the buck facial aspects of the lower cuspid roots. If it's pre-treatment, what that tells you is you probably don't want to expand anymore because, you know, whether there's 0. 0.6 millimeters of bone there or maybe there's a slight dehiscence or there's no dehiscence, there's thin bone. So if you expand, there's not a whole lot of bone to move that tooth. Now, if it's after treatment, if you take a post-treatment coma beam CT and you see thin, slight, you know, you know, or a bit bone that looks like it slightly disappears, I'm, I'm not sure it means anything clinically. But when you see the root that's one third or halfway out of the bone post-treatment, uh, 
then you might want to reconsider your treatment strategy for the next case that's like that. So, I mean, even, I, I believe it's more of a rationalization. The studies that are done on false positives and in, in with using cone beam CT for dehiscence, they're most all done on, or the, they are all done on naturally occurring dehiscence and naturally occurring, occurring dehiscence are quite different mainly in magnitude to dehiscence that is orthodontically induced. We talk about orthodontically induced dehiscence, we're talking about, you know, just the, the roots halfway out or a third of the way out. That's a, that's a big difference from something that just, you know, you have to look at it. And by the way, the studies that on this topic, when there is a significant root dehiscence, it's very easily recognized on the cone beam, and there are not false positives when it comes to that. The false positives are related to minimal or minor dehiscence. Okay, okay, great. Well, um, so how do orthodontists avoid dehiscence then? Let's talk about that. So I, I don't believe we can actually avoid it completely. I think it's just part of what we do. I think the, a realistic uh, objective for treatment planning orthodontic cases is to minimize it at best. So, and I don't, you know, I it, clearly patients can get away with a little bit of root dehiscence. I mean, I think that's, you know, otherwise uh, orthodontic patients be losing teeth left and right. So I think it comes down to proper treatment planning. So there are different treatment strategies. So if you're, for example, if you are a non-extractionist, a complete non-extractionist really doesn't, it, there's not many orthodontists will say, I never ever extract a tooth, but there are some that lean, the, you know, the pendulums towards a non-extraction uh, side, which means they're exp if you have a crowded case, you're expanding. So if you expand and you take a pan and a CEF post-treatment and look at your results, and you're measuring things like the low, the changes in the lower incisor to the mandibular plane angle, you're probably not going not to get that much of a change. But when you look at the cuspids, which you can't evaluate changes radiographically to the cuspids, the only thing you can do is clinically ev evaluate the change of the intercuspid width. But with cone beam, you can actually look at the position of the root cuspids, and this is usually where the the, the roots get dehissed the most because a lot of times, especially with the broader form arch wires, it, they expand the lateral segments, which means they're expanding the cuspids and the first buys. And those kind of changes cannot be measured on a pan and a ceph. So you expand and then you take a pan and a ceph to evaluate, evaluate your finished result. You do the cephalometric analysis and you go, wow, I did a great job on this case. Look, the lower incisor to mandibular plane angle only changed two degrees from what it started with. So, you know, but that's not where the decrowding really came. The decrowding was associated with the changes in intercuspid width. And by the way, there is probably no greater body of refereed scientific literature in orthodontics than changes in the lower intercuspid width. And basically the, the, that literature points in one direction and that is the more you change it, the less stable long-term that case is. So what's happened uh, in orthodontics, in, in my opinion, is that it went, we as orthodontists, as a group, we went through a large discussion about long-term stability of treatment and we've gotten away from that discussion completely, mainly I think because bonded fixed retainers allowed for uh, us to kind of like break all the, the rules of orthodontics and get away with it, at least in the short term. Mm -hmm. So we've gotten away from this discussion about what's gonna be long-term, most stable long-term to this idea that, you know, well, I like my bicusp, it's a little more upright because I think it's more cosmetic. And there, it's to me, it's just a bunch of rationalizations for really poor orthodontic treatment. It's it's almost as if these orthodontists, they're only concerned with the clinical crown. So you started this interview with about you know the direct to consumer uh, 
products that don't take x-rays and there's no doctor to supervise it. And mm. then you, you kind of led into that, you implied that their orthodontists doing the same thing. And I think that is really a problem because as orthodontists, we really need to clean our own house. I mean, I go through some of these Facebook groups and I look at the cases that are posted on there. And these are cases that I look at and I, I just can't believe it. They're, they're, to me, they're gross negligence. I mean, I, and that's putting it nicely. And these <laughs> people are posting these cases and they're proud of it. And then other orthodontists chime in and they go, oh, great job. But they're, they're great cases if you're evaluating results based on the clinical crown alignment. It's, um, they, they've reduced orthodontics to the mechanical alignment of the clinical crowns. It's clear from those cases that these orthodontists that are posting them, they have, they, they're not even mindful of what's going on below the, the, the gingiva or below the CEJ. Because if they were, and it's surprising to me, a lot of these orthodontists actually have cone beam. I was like, what are they, what are they even doing with it? I mean, it, <laughs> if they would, if they would look at it properly and pro do a proper, a proper evaluation on that comb beam, uh, they probably need to change their underwear because it, it would not be pretty. And I've seen so many cases that this, I mean, it's not like it's an outlier. I see them all the time. People come in here and I'm like, let me take a comb beam. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, what do you do now? And it's also, there's a perception in orthodontics, I'll just mention this, that, yeah. you know, if I'm gonna try to line everything thing up, I'm gonna expand, I'm gonna see what it looks like. And then I'll decide later whether I need to extract teeth or not. It's 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 really not good treatment planning because what happens, especially in the lower anterior region, when you do that, the alveolar housing that you had adaptively resorbs to comport with the position of the artificially expanded teeth. And then when you say, well, you know, this is not working out, let me pull teeth and and move the teeth back into the alveolar housing. The alveolar housing that was there when they started treatment is smaller than what they, what they, than what it is after you you try this kind of treatment strategy. So, like I said before, it's not about whether you extract or you know or um, expand. It's about trying the best strategy for the patient that keeps the the root of the tooth centered within the alveolar housing as best as as possible. Some orthodontists will you know, go a step further and they'll add bone pre-treatment so that they, they kind of expand the, the, the alveolar housing. You know, but I think for the majority of cases, a good treatment strategy can orthodontically can still keep the tooth with reasonably within the alveolar housing. You know, I think one, you know, one thing cone bean tells you is probably what not to do. May not mm -hmm. tell you exactly what to do, but they'll tell you, you know, this is not a good plan for this patient, especially right. when you look at different types of alveolar housings, you know, I, and I can show you a slide of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, you, when you look at cone beam, one of the things you really become mindful of is that the alveolar housings are different sizes and shapes. So, I mean, what are you, what are you supposed to do as an orthodontist? Are you supposed to just ignore that information? I mean, that doesn't even make sense, but that's what's happening because supplementary analysis assumes that the, all the alveolar housings are approximately the same size and shape. There's really not a measurement on supplementrics for the most part that, it, that looks at the anatomy of the alveolar housing. And with cone beam, you see it. So you can look at it and you go, whoa, you know, this, this dolicocephalic patient has like a golf tee looking alveolar housing, you know, what, you know, it, you know, do I want to expand this case? I mean, there's a case that was, I have it in my slide deck here that, uh, uh, slide deck's old term, and <laughs> PowerPoint, but it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a dolicocephalic patient that was, I mean, expanded beyond belief. The tissue's all blanched. There's no question that's, that those roots are out of the bone without even looking at cone beam. And they posted up one of the Facebook groups and it was just, you know, nobody said anything bad, which is commendable, but 
people, you know, they a lot of people were complimenting the case. Oh, what great job. But then you saw some comments like, you know, kind of like they didn't want to openly criticize, but they'll say something like, well, what about the tissue recession you, that wasn't there that's associated with these several teeth? You know, what about the tissue blanching? You know, so, you know, these orthodontists, not that they should be jumping on this case and saying how terrible it is, but I think, you know, to learn something, you have to recognize it. And, you know, to show a SAF is going to show you a successful case. To show a cone beam will show you a case that's actually a disaster. Mm, okay. Um, how are you using CBCT in your practice? How does it fit into your clinical workflow and your treatment planning? Okay, so it's a, it's a good question because it does change things. So, mm -hmm. so our diagnostic records, we don't take SEPs anymore. Um, okay. You know, you know, we don't. I mean, we the original cone beam machines we have have a CEF attachment. We don't use it anymore. It's not. Re, it's there's no reason to buy that CEF attachment because you can reconstruct a cephalometric X-ray from the from the cone beam uh, 3D reconstruction very quickly, just like you can reconstruct the Panorex. So we take a cone beam on all our patients. Uh, you know, the argument about a high dose radiation or you're exposing younger children to a higher dose of radiation really doesn't hold any water anymore because the new machines, it's actually uh, about equivalent or maybe a little bit less to take a low dose cone beam versus a pan SF. And that's okay. a digital pan SF. I mean, I, I can't imagine someone still practicing with a, you know, plain film, but those, the radiation levels of those are higher. Right. So that argument about increased radiation doesn't really hold order anymore. The, the, even the low dose cone beams, I mean, they probably wouldn't be good for an endodontist, but they're absolutely fine for an orthodontist, in my opinion. Because we're looking at individual teeth and their alveolar, the anatomy of the alveolar hyalcine that's associated with that tooth, and from that we develop a treatment strategy that you know best keeps those roots within the alveolar housing. And like I said before, and I like to repeat this, you know, to think that you're never going to dehiss at all is not realistic as an orthodontist. It's just try to keep it to a minimum. Okay. I mean, sometimes you have a rotated lower incisor, and the buccal lingual width is actually long, you know, on lower incisor, it's generally wider than the mesial distal width. So when if a tooth is rotated 90 degrees and then you turn it to correct it lower, there's a good chance that there won't be enough alveolar housing to hold that root. So if that patient doesn't want to get a bone graft pre-orthodontic treatment, they take their chances and, you know, you hope their tissue quality is good enough that you know, at least you don't see the tissue dehiscence while they're in treatment. And then later you can blame it on a toothbrushing uh, trauma or something. <laughs> but uh, so what we do is, so we take the, we take comb beam on, on every patient and we, we try to uh, come up with a, a treatment strategy that keeps those teeth within the alveolar housing as best as possible. So if it's, let's say it's an example, it's a patient with 12 millimeters of crowding. Well, I don't think with 12 millimeters of crowding in the lower arch, there's any reasonable uh, orthodontist that thinks that they can expand that arch and not run those roots through the alveolar housing. But let me take that back. If you're an orthodontist and you believe that you're using some kind of magical system that modifies bone as you expand, <laughs> uh, show me the data that supports that because it doesn't exist, okay, <laughs> other than from the manufacturers. So if... <laughs> If you expand on, you know, that that's probably not a good strategy because it's when you look at the post-treatment results, cone beam wise, you, you're going to be upset and it's not a good thing for the pa patient. So in those cases, you know, we, we would, sometimes even an extraction doesn't give you enough space. You have to extract mm -hmm. and then you have to shave a little bit, but that mm -hmm. would be one category. And let's say a patient comes in with generalized spacing where you have to close the space. Well, depending on their alveolar housing, you might not be able to close all the space. So in a case like with a bimaxillary protrusive patient that comes in with 
generalized spacing and tongue thrust. The alveolar housing projection, I can show you this in a image, will, comports with the position of that tooth. So, you know, on those kind of cases, uprighting the lower incisors will probably do quite a bit of damage long term. Plus, it's unstable. So, it might be better, and I'm, you know, that to maybe kind of like not close all the space or leave space for a fifth incisor if you can, if the overjet can tolerate it. Things like that that change what we do as orthodontists, and it really makes you rethink everything. So, you know, some, you know, I'm actually, it, it, I, I joke around with my, my colleagues, like, I've been busy as, you know, I'm so busy going around talk, speaking, and I'm like, why would anybody want to hear what I have to say? I'm telling everybody everything they're doing is wrong. <laughs> but uh, apparently there are people that, you know, and it's like they, you know, it's, there's a group, I'm sure they listen to what I say, and they, they think about it, and then they come back with some kind of ra rationalizations of, you know, to discount the information so they can continue doing what they were doing. And other people, they clearly get it. I get, you know, I get a lot of uh, love, you know? I mean, I, I actually, it's very uh, rewarding to me. I get emails all the time and uh, especially from more experienced orthodontists. They go, you know, I thought about this for years and, and I think it, what it is is, you know, I remember when I was a resident, getting off on a tangent here, but when I was a resident, you know, our chairman, uh, Dr. Uh, Kunat of blessed memory, used to say, you know, pendulum never swings to the middle. It kind of goes from extraction to a non-extraction, and it doesn't stop in the, mid in, in the middle. So I think, you know, we as orthodontists, we always, you know, kind of are, are kind of trying to figure out the best treatment for our, our patients. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, when you're an orthodontist, after about 10 minutes of practice, you realize that parents don't want to hear extractions. Nobody likes to <laughs> lose body parts. So right. if you're, you know, I've heard orthodontists tell me, and I've heard it more than a few times, well, the mom didn't want extractions on a kid. And even though there's 10 millimeters of lower crowding, I'm just doing what the mom said. I'm like, you're the doctor. Let that patient go somewhere else. Right. It's not your... That is not a good thing long long term. You can't tell people what they want to hear and expect that to end well. You do what you know is right. You were trained properly. You went through all that school. And to, to just come up with, uh, to me, that's the, like a lame excuse. The mom didn't want extraction. So therefore, <laughs> I blew all the roots out of the cortical plate because the mom mm -hmm. told me so. Well, the mom's, right. Unless the mom's an orthodontist, then they wouldn't become <laughs> Anyway, so <laughs> the other thing Combeam does, and I think this is a, a tremendous value for us as orthodontists, is if, if we get the patient, you know, let's say in the late mixed dentition or middle mixed dentition, we can take a comb beam and look for potential issues in a 3D uh, format. And that really reveals quite a bit of information. For instance, if there are canines that erupt it, it erupt into the roots of the lateral incisors, more on the upper arch than the lower arch. That can be a completely avoided. And they, what happens is the cuspid erupts into the root of, the, like, say, the lateral incisor and just wipes the root, root out. That can be completely avoided if, if it's caught early. And also, if we can develop a treatment strategy that allows the tooth who erupt within the alveolar housing versus erupt ectop ectopically and then go back orthodontically and try to reposition the tooth back into the alveolar housing later. For example, an ectopic cuspid that comes in out of the arch, we know that ectopic erupt ectopically erupted teeth do not have the same root bone coverage as a tooth that erupts within the center of the alveolar housing. The, the gold standard, I would say, is for the tooth to erupt within the alveolar housing. Mm -hmm. And comb beam allows you to, to better come up with a strategy to allow that to happen, providing you see the patient early enough. And it, I think that's tremendous. And I, I'm not aware of anybody that's actually uh, talking about these kinds of strategies today. I mean, I know there are people now 
going around talking about keeping the teeth in the alveolar housings and how important that is. We also have now a uh, technology that allows us to virtually treatment plan the cases using the bone modeling of the cone beam CT, which I think is tremendous. Okay. And you can see if, you know, you know, although it's not perfect, the bone modeling static, mm -hmm. at least you can tell what not to do. When half the roots yeah. sticking out of the bone, uh, you maybe want to rethink a treatment strategy. Okay. Okay. So what's your advice to orthodontists considering a CBCT purchase? Okay. So first of all, my the best advice I can give you is don't buy the cephalometric attachment. You don't need it. Mm -hmm. uh, once you start re realize, first of all, you can recreate the ceph and you can get a perfect ceph because you're going to line up the left and right side and superimpose okay. them exactly. Okay. You, you don't need the cephalometric attachment. That's the first advice. The second advice I would give them is when you look at these machines, all these machines have gotten better. So they're all, you know, it's kind of like as they progress, the technology gets better, the image quality is better. The, the it's like almost like a analog TV versus a high definition TV. Okay. When you look and you're comparing the, the, the different machines, don't get caught up in the software that reproduces a Ceph and a pan because you're probably, as you mature into the cone beam CT world, those become less and less and less and less relevant. You also need to find out the cost per year for the service agreement, the licensing agreement. Some of the cone beam machines have a very hefty yearly fee for mm -hmm. their, their their maintenance agreement, okay. and some of them some of them have zero fee. Mm. That's that's you know very important in terms of your the overall cost to you for the Comi CT machine. And I would say that any orthodontist that's starting out today or building a new practice, I think would be foolish to purchase a digital pan and Ceph when the difference in cost is really not significant at this point. And having the comb beam, uh, I think just, I don't see a downside to it other than, you know, you you may not want to see what you, what you see, you know, kind of some kind of ignorance is bliss kind of thing. But <laughs> back in 1959, Steiner mm -hmm. said the same thing about cephalometric analysis. The orthodontist mm -hmm. were resistant to using cephalometrics. And he said something, there's a quote, I can give it to you later, uh, that, you know, he said, they're either... You know they don't they're afraid to see what they say so and i think mm -hmm. it's the same thing uh with with comb beam there's no argument that comb beam doesn't provide more information the argument right. is kind of like goes in like a in the, the way of you know well i don't need comb beam to treat these cases because the ceph and pan are kind of the standard of care and that's you know what i use and i'm a you know i'm a, the best orthodontist in the world so i don't need to change anything so how does cone beam move orthodontics back to the specialty arena? How does it go back to being what it was? It's a great question. And I believe it, it is going to be the thing that projects orthodontics back into the specialty arena, whether or not orthodontists participate in that movement or not. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, every orthodontist wants it back in the specialty arena where, of course, you know, I believe as a specialist, it belongs. But what 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 happens is several things. First of all, when you start looking at cases through comb beam, they become more complex. You know, what do you do here? If you're just looking at it from the basis of a, the clinical crown alignment, mm -hmm. cases are, you know, your world is much simpler. So it, mm -hmm. it makes it more complex. Imagine for a second that the aligner companies would start showing comb beam CT as part of their virtual treatment. You know, then the, you go to align the teeth and you're like, well, wait a second, these roots aren't in the bone properly anymore. And by the way, there are companies uh, that that do that now for us. And what what we're finding is that, you know, these, these, they're, they're, these dentists are questioning, you know, wait a second, I thought I could just line these teeth up and expand everything, but now I'm looking at the comb beam version of the like the virtual simulation 
and it doesn't look so great. So that's happening now. Also, what's happening is the literature is becoming much more clear as to what happens when you orthodontically dehist the root through the cortical plate. You know, prior to, you know, when chrome beam was kind of new, uh, first of all, people didn't know how to uh, evaluate it. But secondly, it was, and people weren't mindful of it because it's, they were using chrome beam like a Seth and Pan. You know, they weren't looking at individual teeth. Now that orthodontists that are versed in comb beam are looking at individual teeth. They're seeing the manifestations of, I would say, poor orthodontic treatment strategies. Mm -hmm. So, but that's really not the main reason why it's going to move back into the specialty arena. I think the main reason is because orthodontists do not practice in a vacuum, as I said before. Our patients are shared with other dental professionals. So when that patient that we treated 5, 10, 15 years ago goes to the periodontist, I mean, I don't know a single periodontist that doesn't take comb beam now on patients. Oh, okay. A good number of general dentists have comb beam. And right. as the prices of comb beam machines uh, decrease, you know, when they go to replace their digital pan, they're not going to get a digital pan. They're going to get a comb beam. Right. So they're going to take comb beams on their patients. They're going to recognize orthodontic dehiscence pattern. I mean, it's, it's distinct. You've seen one, you've seen them all. It's a generalized dehiscence pattern of a much higher magnitude. So that, that orthodontist that is coming up with all these rationalizations of why they don't need to extract teeth because they're modifying bone and things like that, when that patient ends up in another dentist's office, whether it's a periodontist or a general dentist, and they take a comb beam and they see that general pattern of root dehiscence, they're going to know, you know, definitively that that was caused by the orthodontic treatment. Mm, yeah. So that, you know, so then then what do you do? So you're the. The point is the cases you treat today are going to be evaluated differently five to 10 years from now. So if you think about that, orthodontist, you know, this is what we do. So we're going to, we'll pivot. Some of us will pivot faster. Some of us will pivot later. The general dentists that are doing orthodontics, and most of them, when they do it, they use, you know, they, there are systems, like, you know, they're using aligners or they're using, you know, some of those systems that are bracketing systems that are marketed directly to uh, general dentists. I mean, mm -hmm. most of the general dentists are, you know, I would consider what's called a clinical crown jo jockey. They only <laughs> care about the mechanical alignment of the clinical crowns. That's that's okay. their that's their metric for whether it's treated successfully or not. Those those general dentists are going to take a comb beam on their patient at some point, and they're or they're going to end up in another general dentist's office, and that person going to take a comb beam, or they're going to send them to periodontists that they're going to take a comb beam, and they're going to say. Oh my gosh! Look what I did. Well, they'll stop doing it because the last mm -hmm. thing they want is a is a lawsuit, and there are already right. lawsuits associated with orthodontic movement that pushes teeth out of the alveolar bone. This is it's, you know this is stuff before combing you couldn't really kind of visualize it as easily until the until the damage occurred. Now you can see mm -hmm. it in, in advance of the tissue recession, and that's right. those things are all going to push orthodontics, in my humble opinion. Back to the orthodontic, the, the uh, specialty arena. Think about all the, and I'm not criticizing the general dentist. I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea. They know what they're taught by the manufacturer of the liners. So they think what they're doing is appropriate until something comes along that shows them it doesn't, it's not. You know, if they get an implant from an oral surgeon and the implant is sticking out of the alveolar bone, they know there's something wrong. Well, you think uh, that, the, you know, any general dentist that looks at comb beam and it sees the root outside of the alveolar housing is going to say, oh, my gosh, maybe I should rethink this and, you know, refer it out, you know, or I'll, I'm going to stop doing this. I don't I don't need this kind of aggravation on me to complicate my life. And and uh, I think all those things are, in a, you know, push it. And you think about the volume of just the liners that are being done today by non-orthodontic specialists. Right. And, you know, I know in my practice, we do aligners, you know, and 
there's many times we have to pivot the treatment plan, we have to make adjustments, and I'm sure that's with everybody. It, they're not as easy as people think, just, oh, I'm going to give the plastic to them and they're going to take care of itself. Mm -hmm. It's not that, you know, nothing is ever that simple. And they're going to, you know, it's just the vast volume of it is just going to, I think it's going to implode. But yeah. that's just my humble opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, Dr. Miller, thank you so much for your time and taking the time to kind of explain this to uh, to our um, viewers. <laughs> In the meantime, to catch up with past episodes or check out the latest orthodontic industry news, visit our website, orthodontproductsonline.com. Thank you. Thank you so much.